this is a collaboration with a bunch of people, uh, including the Boisha. Um, and this is almost a presentation that has the kind of sickening yet deserved uh, uh, gush about our friend, uh, Scott Falci, who is a neurosurgeon and with whom we have worked for seven or eight years on this project. And what this project is about is a bunch of things, kind of simple, conceptually. Uh, at Somalogic, we do something called Soma Scan, which is uh, proteomics measurements of 7,000 human proteins at once. So we call that Soma Scan. And some of you here today have read every paper we've ever published about SOMASCAN, and some of you have uh, read none. And um, I, that's, that's okay, of course. We don't have rules about what you have to read. But, um, and I, I'm not going to do much to say, well, we know how to measure 7,000 proteins, we get quantitative data, it's good. And, We've done hundreds of thousands of samples. We wanna take a general problem of quantifying proteins using our version of aptomers, which are solomers, to, uh, to highlight a question. When you find a diagnostic marker for proteomics, PSA, if you have prostate cancer, while you know you have found a marker, a biomarker, so-called, you actually don't know anything other than it's a biomarker, that it's a closed circle. And the question that we really would like to know sometimes is, um, well, is that protein that's correlated with a disease state uh, ever part of a causal pathway? because for most of the things we try to help people do, it would be nicer if it was an identified protein that was in some pathway that was related to the condition. And for those of you like me, I've spent a lot of time in the last few years reading about causality. And if you're not careful when you read books that are said to be profound about causality, you end up finding out that some people really do think that a butterfly in, a, in the Amazon can affect somebody's uh, biology in the middle of Seattle. And that kind of causality interests me zero, uh, although it is formal. And so the idea is really to let's say, find close by causality, uh, something that is really directly involved in a meaningful way where you don't have to make up stuff about butterflies. So that's what we're gonna do. And, and But it is an ode really to Scott Falch, who's our friend and who has done a remarkable piece of work for the last 30 years, okay? So I'll do this. It's a quick and easy story, and I'm going to try to do it quicker than I have many times. So that I can skip completely. That's quick. There you go. Uh, we, we, meaning uh, Scott Felchy and a few other people, have formed a company. Its name is Extalgo. It's in Colorado. And the whole idea of this company is to identify proteins that are involved in generating pain, initially a narrow pain, sub, a bunch of people who have a what looks like a narrow kind of pain. And we think slash hope slash dream, there's some word there that's right. We think that um, this is really uh, about finding protein targets for all pain or lots of pain and not just the particular people in pain that Scott Falci studied. So, um, so this is really a collaboration between two companies, one that's 30 years old, 
us, Soma Logic, and the other that's uh, three weeks old, Extalgo. But the work that Extalgo did also had 30 years of, of effort because this is really hard stuff. So the thing on the left is who we are. Uh, we're a proteomics company, blah, 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 blah. We use fancy aptamers to quantify 7,000 proteins that meant that uh, menu will grow, is growing. We've run about 500,000 samples, mostly plasma from different people. Uh, we work with AI and all the modern stuff called big data, which by the way, most people, including me, don't actually have a clear definition of. And um, so that's what we did for our 30 years. And then over here, there is um, what Extalgo is doing. And um, it's pretty interesting. Um, because of the kind of medicine Scott Fauci practices, he worked on, um, on people who've had terrible spinal cord injury. He's ended up studying a large number of people, a few hundred in um, Craig Hospital in Denver who uh, as a result of their paralysis and the spinal cord injury that caused that paralysis, uh, people experienced uh, debilitating suicidal levels of pain. And, um, and Scott drove him crazy because he's a good guy, and good doctor. He listened to his patients and eventually through a miracle of hard work, he figured out what tissue in a person with a spinal cord injury, what tissue almost always below the injury. So where the patient was paralyzed, there was a tissue that he found that seemed to cause pain. And I'm gonna show you that. And then we're gonna analyze that tissue by some scan and look at proteins that are elevated in that tissue and hopefully some of them will be directly involved in pain. And because some of those proteins have drugs already against them, we get to test that idea. And it turned out to be true. This is, which is actually, once you've heard that now you can take a rest. Um, so here's um, what, what uh, Scott has helped us learn because course, none of us knew any of this stuff. Um, people with spinal cord injuries have near suicidal levels of pain, often below the break. And, um, and it's equivalent, I guess, formally, the words are the same as talking about phantom pain. When someone has had a limb amputated, they sometimes have pain coming from the non-existent limb. And um, the idea of that is uh, bewildering. Uh, it's still bewildering, although less so today because of Scott's work than before. And uh, this is a reminder of who he is, Scott Felchie, because none of you have ever met him. Uh, he does not travel in these circles, nor do we travel in his. Uh, he was the chief neurosurgeon for decades at Craig Hospital, which is a hospital that focuses on spinal cord injury patients. And um, Scott's first job when, when he would see the patients was to stabilize them so that their spinal cord injury didn't lead to death. And then his patients over a small number of weeks or even a couple of months, would go from being paralyzed and not in pain to paralyzed and in extraordinary pain. And he found the tissues, I'll show you what he found that were responsible for that pain, found that if he ablated them or resected them, the tissues, um, those causal tissues, it, the pain was relieved. And so he had causal tissue and so it was a simple task to come find us in Boulder since he lived in Denver to uh, run the samples. Uh, and we did that for him. And we found some bunch of proteins that were 
I in the causal tissue. Some of those uh, proteins that were high already had drugs for other reasons, not necessarily pain. And, uh, and we've tried a couple. So that's the story that we're gonna tell, okay? And, um, and this just divides us up into Extalgo, which is to say Scott. Extalgo was Scott. There was no other, no one else working with him mostly. And then we did this thing we do, and we found about 60 proteins. I'll show you that. And, um, and so in a way, the, this, first, this is the first time really that we've ever talked about this stuff. So we found drugs that can be repurposed for pain. Two of them work so far. The only two were tried. And there's a whole bunch of uh, proteins against which we should make new drugs. And so the, the real question that you should be asking throughout this talk is whether the pain that Extalgo will go after is limited to pain in spinal cord injury patients or is more general. We think it's more general and therefore we think that uh, Extalgo will meet a big unmet medical need, uh, especially with the opioid disaster that we are living in. So that I've already done that. Um, so there is a key paper here and you can uh, read it. By the way, if you want these slides, no one ever does, but if you want them, uh, just send me an email at oldlgold at somologic and I'll pop them over to you. Um, this paper is the beginning really. After 30 years of working, he was T. Scott was ready to tell people what he had done. And most people, uh, the reaction was, uh, come on, uh, it was not uh, nice um, because, because it's a hard problem. And people were experiencing pain, these three patients uh, in, in uh, particular, below their spinal cord injury. And the spinal cord injury was a complete transection of the spinal cord. So they didn't feel anything. They were complete quadriplegics. Nothing worked for their pain. And Scott found the tissue. And when he removed it, the pain went away. They were, the people were still paralyzed, uh, but the pain was gone, mostly gone. So here's a picture that if you're like me, this would be the first time you've ever thought about any of this because uh, you know I don't I don't know any I never took anatomy I don't know anything about anatomy. This is a picture of um, it's a spinal cord image, and you can see the stuff and uh, and um, and there are places in what is called the DREZ, it's up there, on, it's on the map, the dorsal root entry zone. In my uh, molecular biology life, I and others around me never used that word, sorry. Um, and um, Scott had this idea after looking at patients who were experiencing pain that there had to be something electrical happening even though their spinal cords were severed. And he got a little gizmo to go up and down the spinal column and measure electrical activity. And when he did that, he found these little places right on the dorsal root entry zones, so labeled, where there was a lot of electrical activity, the, the so-called hot tissue on the left and adjacent to it, a millimeter or two away would be a cold tissue like the graph on the right. And usually, in fact, in every one of the 300 people he's done this to, the little bit of hot tissue was surrounded going up and down the spinal column with um, cold tissue. So he would find 
uh, and to a first approximation, one place with half tissue and long lengths of tissue. It looked exactly the same. That was um, cold. Um, he's explained to us we're we're like little kids uh, sitting at his feet as we get to know him better and better. Uh, and he um, has explained to us that nothing after a car accident or a real injury, uh, nothing looks as pristine as this picture. There's a lot of stuff mangled. In fact, it's the mangled stuff that he operates on first to stabilize and save people's lives. And so you don't get anything that looks quite like this. And so um, there's the surgery for each person takes a, almost a full day, it's like 16 hours or so. Uh, you have to find the electrically active tissue, you have to poke around. You kind of know where that tissue is from the patient telling you that the pain is coming, for example, from his or her left ankle. And he's over these 30 years of doing this stuff, constructed a kind of map. And the map is if it's their left ankle that hurts, I'm gonna find the hot tissue at a particular uh, vertical location going up and down the spine and on one side or the other. And so he, he kind of knows this, but knows that even though there's no way to get to the brain that anybody knows, and it's the brain that have these pain centers separated now from the, uh, the lower portion of the body. So, it, you know, so it's really quite a mystery that he's been working on for a long, long time. Um, I should say now, and somebody will ask if anybody is still awake at the end. Um, the, um, he has done with collaborators at Harvard in a big functional MRI lab. He has shown that the, if you're doing functional MRI on the brain, in patients who have a completely severed spinal column that the brain functional MRI data changes uh, when the operation that he does, the ablation or resection is done. So there is no question that severed spinal column or not, the information that says uh, wow, we just had a resection, makes it to the brain. And that is uh, something that Scott has, is quite comfortable thinking he understands. But for those of us who are joined him in this, it is, uh, it's not easy to, to, you can say the words, but it's hard to understand. This is the so-called sympathetic nervous system, which again, molecular biologists uh, don't tend to, think about. So um, so here's a picture of a person that had a place where there was an injury and there was a electrical hyperactivity surgery, guided, guided surgery, and the pain goes away. And so it's just a picture of what I've been saying. The part that we did, of course, was to do proteomics on the resectable pain causing tissue. And, and there are lots of slides that you've seen many, many times from Neboisha, me. This is one of my favorites. This is a, one of the six co-crystals we have of aptamers, our special branch of aptamers with a protein target. It's wonderful. You, you, you wouldn't easily guess, probably 50% which one is the soma or the abdomen and which one is the protein. And, um, and we do this thing where we today measure 7,000 proteins um, at, at a very high specificity and high uh, accuracy. This is, this is my favorite slide in this presentation. I showed this recently and it was no one else's favorite slide, but it is mine. So you'll have to look at it for a minute anyway. The, um, 
this summer scan thing we do, measuring 7,000 proteins, our goal for the 30 years we've been working on this has been to get the cost of this to be so low that everyone can do it. And um, we have dreams of this being as good as a glucose monitor that sits on your wrist. But it'll take a lot of engineering and a lot of stuff. And so this is a cartoon somebody sent about the, you know, you can do better with that soma scan. Uh, the one I really like is uh, if you forgot to unzip, it's Alzheimer's. I think that's good. A friend of mine, Sharon Terry, called up last night and complained that this is a gender narrow cartoon. I'm sorry, sorry for that. Um, so, um, okay, so here's then the same picture you saw a minute ago of a spinal column. And there's the proteomics that we did on the hot tissue and cold tissue uh, that were right next to each other and really looked to Scott, who is a pro at this, I'm absolutely the same. And when we did that, we got for us something that is as good as we ever see. So this is a volcano plot of the data from SOMASCAN. There are 5,000, this is not 7,000, this was done on an earlier version of SOMASCAN. And um, the, um, the data show a whole bunch of dots for each protein, there's a dot. And they mostly cluster uh, in the middle of, uh, of a spike of stuff around one, meaning there was no difference in the hot and cold tissue about the level of all those proteins whose dots are on the left. And, um, and then there are in this figure about 60 proteins, dots to the, what you sometimes call the upper quadrant. And they are proteins that are uh, over uh, expressed or over higher concentrations in the hot tissue compared to the cold. And one of them is the first one I wanna tell you about. It's a protein whose name is SV2A. And then in a moment, I'll tell you about the second target that we've done, looked at carefully. So um, SV2A is a synaptic vesicle protein 2A. Huh. Okay. And um, it's thought to be both in the tissue that we uh, ground up and ran on soma scan, as well as in the brain, it says right here. And we found at Craig Hospital, Scott found eight spinal cord injury patients who had enormous levels of pain. And they were asked if they would like Scott's surgery for which he's famous. Um, and um, they declined. I learned something about that. The, 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 the surgery that Scott does, the reception or, or the um, cauterization. So you just really have to destroy the tissue. You don't have to remove it. It, it is for sure uh, something patients think hard about because while their pain is awful and doesn't respond to any drugs usually, um, they are nervous about and express this to Scott, their, his, their doctor. Uh, when they say they don't want surgery, what they're really saying is that they are hoping that someday we, we sciencey types and engineer types will figure out a way to connect their spinal columns from above the break to below the break and restore function, which has been a dream for, for a long, long time for people. And um, and it tends to be those people who would rather try a drug. And here was one 
candidate that maybe would uh, relieve the pain. And remarkably it did. Of the eight patients, these are five self-reported pain uh, numbers that these patients provided to Scott. And um, in his entire life, this man who has been trying to solve this problem for 30 years has never seen anything like this. These are people for whom none of the drugs, including opioids, relieve their pain at all. And, and even though these things have a scale that none of us understand, it is true that every one of these five people um, had tolerable pain. Uh, it didn't have to reduce pain much from suicidal, you know, a 10 on this scale to be uh, able to live your life. You're still paralyzed, but you live your life without much enough pain to be excruciating. And um, so that's what the patients that he talked to, and this is the results and the results was something he had never seen. Um, <clears throat> five out of eight patients, the answer so far. And he, Scott, has just received a large grant from the NIH to do uh, 20 more patients uh, with even more measurements of what, what's going on. And um, he also got a new job. And there was a slide earlier that the, the, the hospital chain that owns Swedish Hospital uh, is building him a big institute so he can work on pain, which is his um, passion with a large number of patients throughout the system. Uh, of, uh, he'll probably have access to thousands of patients a year uh, through, the, through his job at, um, at a Swedish Hospital in Denver. So here's the second proof. I mean, this is already amazing. I mean, because for those of you who are in the drug discovery business know that if you choose a target to go after, um, mostly you're wrong. Uh, it's hard. <clears throat> this idea of causality is very difficult. So Scott was one for one. Um, and with some trepidation, I would say, he chose another target too. We don't name this because, not because of much, except it seems to us, and we'd love to hear from you about this, that docs have a right to prescribe drugs um, and um, that are approved for anything for something else. And when, so SV2A is the only drug we've done on eight patients. It's still a tiny number and it doesn't work for everybody. Um, five of eight and target two we've done on one patient, but it worked. So Scott is two for two from the 60 that we've looked at. 15 of those 60 have drugs. So he's two for 15. Um, when we look at these as names, it might as well say hexokinase, for example, for a guy like me. But he and uh, John Swindle know um, these pathways pretty well. And so this is pretty exciting. Okay. Um, so um, these slides, it turns out, I looked at them very carefully this morning, and every slide that goes from here to the end, which is a few more slides, is saying the same things that I've been telling you. Uh, so uh, it's like the worst behavior. Come on, let me tell you that again. Well, because it's so exciting, but you have already heard the data. Um, and um, and we're gonna do more. We're both going to try the other drugs that are repurposable, meaning they are already approved for something. And we're gonna go after new chemical entities and monoclonal antibodies and somomers for the 45 that we don't yet have drugs. 
that second drug that worked once is actually a monoclonal antibody suggesting, given systemically, suggesting at least some of the targets can be reached with big molecules that probably don't get into cells very well. So there's a lot to be learned here uh, for sure, okay? And um, we have one last slide, which is this one, which is that we've kind of merged Scott's neurosurgery stuff with our proteomics to be able to think that we have a shot at making a difference for people in, um, in ways that are hard to do in the biotech and pharma businesses. That's it. Thank you very much.